Uh, you probably received an email, an email recently uh, saying something about uh, signing up uh, for a dinner. Here is the place to do it. So if you want to sign up for the dinner, for the conference dinner that will take place uh, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. on the location that the map shows. And uh, so uh, now uh, for the uh, first lecture of cosmology, I just want to say we are very, very grateful to all the lecturers that agreed to uh, uh, participate uh, giving these wonderful lectures. But we are particularly, particularly grateful to Jay Hobbies from Syracuse University who agreed kind of last minute uh, to, to uh, step in uh, and uh, really uh, uh, help us. Uh, Jay actually is participating in another program uh, here for a few weeks and he uh, very kindly uh, agreed to step in for uh, the cosmology lectures, which are going to be great. Jay uh, has crammed an amazing amount of uh, contributions in a, what I would say is a shorter career, a short career so far because it's, you're so much <laughs> younger than me, so it must be short <laughs> by definition, uh, uh, going from uh, uh, particle theory, phenomenology, uh, now into quantum information applications into particle theory, and now he's going to tell us about cosmology and particle theory. So, Jay, please. Well, thank you so much for the super kind introduction, I, and uh, uh, I consider it almost nothing because of the generosity of the uh, organizers here who have uh, uh, made this uh, such a great place to be, uh, both for the workshop and now I'm excited uh, to, to be here uh, with you folks to talk a little bit about cosmology. Uh, in part, I agreed to this because I really wanted to get a lot of this uh, you know, firmer for myself. Uh, and so uh, uh, I, I hope that we uh, all gain something from this experience over the, next, uh, over the course of the next week. Um, so I, I want to start off uh, by uh, talking a little bit about the standard model of particle physics, uh, which uh, you heard about some of the problems in that probably uh, from the first lecture today, uh, Professor Chabachaki. So uh, as I, I'm, I'm sure you know, the standard model of particle physics does an extraordinarily good job uh, of looking at most uh, collider physics observables, making prediction for collider physics observables. Uh, there are some anomalies. But as of yet, there's no real slam dunk uh, uh, evidence for uh, physics beyond the standard model uh, in colliders. We can argue about neutrino masses, whether or not that counts as, as BSM. The, the issue with neutrino masses is that the inferred scale uh, is very, very high uh, when you look at uh, what new physics might be contributing to the neutrino masses. There are uh, many theoretical uh, uh, issues uh, with it, like the hierarchy problem, strong CP. But let's uh, just make a list of some of the things that the standard model of particle physics does not get right. OK. So uh, we'll start off with neutrino masses. They're not incorporated in the standard model uh, automatically. There is the fact that we exist. Matter-antimatter asymmetry. There is the surprising absence of CP violation in the strong sector. Uh, there is the fact that to uh, accommodate uh, what we uh, see in the universe, there is a dark matter component. And uh, to accommodate for uh, the uh, uh, acceleration of the expansion of the universe, there is dark energy. There are uh, uh, aspects of Big Bang cosmology that seem to point towards the requirement for an inflationary epoch uh, in the early universe. Standard model doesn't technically include uh, gravity as a, a part of it. It's not part of the quantum theory. And there's the age hierarchy problem. The smallness of the uh, Higgs mass 
when referenced uh, with respect to other uh, scales that we expect to be present in the theory, like the gut scale or the Planck scale. There's things like the Yukawa textures, fermion masses. And so if you look uh, at, this, at this list, and maybe you, you like to expand it a little depending on what your own preference is. I'm just giving a, a list of kind of the big ones. A uh, surprising uh, number of them have to do in some way uh, with cosmology, right? Cosmology should produce the matter-a-matter-a -a -matter -a symmetry uh, that we see. Um, uh, strong CP violation is more of a uh, 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 part of the theory problem. But dark matter, dark energy, part of cosmology. Inflation, part of cosmology and astrophysics. Gravity, of course. Okay? And so uh, uh, the study of cosmology is uh, hopefully going to help us out understanding, well, first defining the problems associated uh, uh, with what we're writing down here, and also maybe point at some resolutions or solutions. Okay? So what does looking at cosmology uh, give us access to that uh, uh, collider physics does not give us access to. One of the first things we might write down are the sort of scales that we can uh, probe by looking at uh, the early universe or uh, different astrophysical systems. There are Time scales, temperatures, and high densities. So we can just list a few of the things in cosmological or astrophysical environments uh, that give us access uh, to things that we don't have uh, access to here on Earth, uh, you know, partly uh, uh, because of, uh, we don't have infinite uh, money resources uh, for doing it or infinite technological access uh, to get access to these. Inflation presumably happens at some uh, uh, very high scale where we don't know uh, what the physics is uh, going on there. Reheating, something that has to happen after inflation uh, to uh, uh, generate the uh, particles that we see in the universe today. And maybe other uh, things that have to happen uh, between the scale of inflation and reheating and uh, current day, like maybe early universe phase transitions, things like this, okay? Uh, and so the universe proceeded through a whole bunch of energy scales uh, as uh, time went on in the early universe. The long age of the universe allows us uh, to integrate things over an extra long time. So if imagine I have some, uh, you know, very weakly coupled particle, its uh, influence might be noticeable only when integrating over the uh, lifetime of the universe. Or perhaps the lifetime of a star. Maybe dark matter is such that uh, it scatters off of stars and starts to collect uh, inside the volume of the star over time. Uh, but this is a very slow process. And so you need to integrate uh, over a long time scale in order for an appreciable amount of dark matter to collect there and then maybe annihilate in our sun and uh, you know, spit little things into our detectors here on Earth. The time scale for formation and collisions of galaxies, uh, right? So if I uh, get two galaxies colliding together, they can give us uh, an extraordinarily beautiful picture like the bullet cluster, which gives us pretty slam dunk evidence for uh, some form of dark matter, okay? High temperatures, there's the Big Bang, and current day things that happen like supernovae or kilonovae, like what are uh, produced when uh, you get the collision of two uh, neutron stars, okay? 
and high densities. And here by high densities, I mean things like a, an accumulation of a, a high number of baryons and a small amount of space, like what happens in the uh, core of a neutron star. So huge N baryon in neutron stars. And so uh, uh, you can uh, uh, now, you know, using these laboratories that the universe uh, made for us, ask the question, uh, how might we find evidence of physics beyond the standard model that hopefully sheds some light on these uh, problems that we have in the standard model of particle physics and allows us to see uh, how they might be resolved. And so what are what is sort of the basic uh, uh, organization of uh, some of these uh, scales at very early times uh, and very high scale. We have inflation. And beyond that, basically question marks, because inflation uh, sort of uh, resets uh, the, uh, the universe and makes it a, a quasi-blank slate with important uh, uh, perturbations that are generated during inflation that are then expected to seed uh, the uh, uh, perturbations that then grow into what we see today as uh, uh, stars and galaxies. Okay. And then following inflation, there is reheating. So you get a blank slate. Now I need to put everything back again. And then other stuff, uh, like maybe something that generates a, a baryon or lepton number asymmetry. And we don't know exactly where these things go. But at some point, uh, we have a couple of reference scales that we know exist. Uh, we know that there is uh, an electroweak phase transition uh, when the Higgs uh, develops a vacuum expectation value and gives mass uh, to the standard model particles. This is about at about 100 GeV. And uh, then about a, a factor of 1,000 below that, uh, we have the uh, QCD crossover. That is uh, the temperature at which uh, there's a quark gluon plasma at higher temperatures. And then as I uh, proceed below the crossover, uh, we have the, the bound states of uh, 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 quarks and gluons, baryons, and mesons. It's not a strict phase transition. Uh, it's one of those things where there's a, you know, a critical point nearby, and so there's just a smooth uh, sort of transition between the quark gluon plasma and the, uh, uh, and the, the baryons and mesons. OK. And now there's some question about where do you put these things. Well, we know we can't put too much stuff too low. Uh, uh, because we know the physics there very well. Or if we do put something there, we better be really darn careful that we don't mess up the standard picture uh, of cosmology, which is going to be uh, what I'm going to spend uh, most of today uh, uh, talking about. So many of you will be familiar, uh, perhaps, with uh, a lot of the things I, I say today, but this is to, uh, you know, we start off with a blank slate, and we want to make sure that we're all uh, in the same place as we uh, move on with this uh, series of lectures this, this week. OK. And so the idea of these lectures is uh, to, to start to give you some proficiency in learning uh, how to connect fundamental physics the standard model and beyond to uh, cosmological observables
particularly be a, a physics beyond the standard model. OK. And so let's draw a basic picture uh, of what this kind of dictionary looks like and where uh, new physics can uh, have its influence. Before I dive in, I, uh, uh, so as Gustavo introduced, uh, I didn't have a whole lot of time uh, to think about and prepare for these lectures, and so I uh, relied very heavily on very uh, uh, amazing and outstanding uh, source material. Um, a lot of what I'll uh, do comes from uh, Daniel Bauman's TASI 2017 lectures, and so uh, if, if you folks uh, want some additional uh, reading material, I uh, suggest you uh, go, go there, and you'll see that a lot of what I'm doing kind of follows along with this. And by the way, I'll send uh, these, these slides at the end uh, to the folks so that it ends up on the uh, uh, course website, along with any little problems that I assign uh, during uh, the, the lecture today for you, okay? Um, I also used uh, uh, some material from James Klein Tossy lectures, uh, and I uh, highly recommend that either, uh, if, so if, if you have Mathematica, that's uh, fantastic. This is what I uh, often use. We'll be doing some GR stuff, and uh, I uh, part don't in particular find it, uh, uh, you know, soul affirming to calculate Christoffel symbols by hand. Once I know how to do it once, I can tell the computer to go do it for me. Uh, and so uh, uh, the package that I uh, particularly like to use is uh, Greater2 that has uh, been written up by Tom Hartman and is available uh, on uh, uh, his website. Um, and so, but if you have something else that allows you to uh, uh, circumvent uh, too many indices, then uh, that, that's fine too. Uh, and so um, some of the homework problems I will uh, uh, give out uh, have some sort of GR calculations, I uh, encourage you to use the software or to find a friend that has the software and uh, work on them together if that's what you want to do, okay? Okay, so with that, and this is for later, I'm mostly gonna be using the Blackboard. I have a few visual aids uh, to help out going through. Is there a question or, no, just a stretch, okay. Okay, so, what is the uh, uh, main idea? How do we connect fundamental physics to cosmologi cosmological observables? What we want to understand is what you might call the cosmological pipeline. Uh, we have the initial conditions set at some uh, very early time in the early universe. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to take those initial conditions and move them forward uh, to the present day when we're actually making observations. So we have some set of initial conditions. Let's see. Say some perturbations. They don't have perturbations. They don't have anything to, to look at, right? So we need uh, some correlations of uh, some sort of perturbations that are part of these initial conditions that, once seeded uh, over time, they develop via time evolution into correlations of some cosmological observables. So a very uh, a famous one would be uh, uh, things that, uh, uh, you know, the temperature fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. That would be an example of an observable that appears here on the uh, right-hand side where uh, perhaps you have your favorite model of inflation that uh, produced those initial seeds that grew into these uh, non-trivial cosmological obser observables, okay? And so now, where does the model building uh, happen? So if you have your favorite model of inflation that maybe is not the you know, standard slow roll single field inflation, then your model building would affect the initial conditions that then grew into those observables. Or perhaps it's something that affected uh, the evolution of those initial seeds 
into those cosmological observables. Okay? And so uh, uh, what, is this, what does this look like? So let's look at maybe just a couple of toy examples uh, that influence first the initial conditions and second the evolution. So uh, many of you have probably at some point seen the, uh, a picture of what a, a standard inflationary model looks like. If not, it's that I have some scalar potential that's uh, uh, pretty flat overall. And I uh, start off with the scalar field at some high point on the potential. And then as a function of time, the scalar field slowly rolls down. Okay? And this produces some uh, particular class of uh, initial conditions, the details of which we'll talk about later. Okay? Now, uh, let's, let's draw a different picture, though. Let's add a little bit of new physics to the mix in, uh, compared to this picture, where perhaps the inflaton, phi, the thing that's rolling down the potential here, has some coupling to other, some other species. Uh, maybe it's the Higgs. Maybe it's just some other particle that happens to be around at the time. So we add uh, an interaction between this new species and the inflaton. So phi naught is just some constant uh, that's appearing in the action that we're writing down, or the term in the action that we're writing down. And OK, we square that. But then this is a quartic interaction that involves uh, two inflatons and some new field chi. OK? But now let's imagine we're in a slow roll picture a little bit like this one. And now, if we look at this, this is a slowly evolving mass term for this field chi, which means that if phi rolls through phi naught, then something interesting is going to happen. This, the mass squared uh, of this thing is uh, going to get driven close to zero. So let's call it a quote unquote mass term. And then after that, it'll recover, right? So this thing is uh, uh, you know, squared here. So after I pass through this special point, the mass of chi will go back to being positive. If this field uh, gets a mass term that goes close to zero during inflation, all of a sudden, it costs very little energy to make this thing. And so I'm going to explosively produce this particle in the other universe. The, I'm rolling down, I'm rolling down, and then all of a sudden, something big happens, quasi-catastrophic. And this slow roll kind of picture is probably not valid here, right? This thing is going to back-react on the geometry. It's going to back-react on the scalar potential. Uh, and so, OK, I haven't specified the whole picture here, but we can probably guess that when we come out of this, you know, maybe the uh, potential has a different slope. Maybe it has a different value when it comes out of this. OK. And then I keep rolling down. So I have an initial inflationary period and then a secondary inflationary period, but something's happened in between. So what this means is that there's going to be a feature in these initial conditions that carries the hallmarks of this uh, uh, a transitory epoch uh, during inflation. So you transition to a new inflation scale. That is the actual value of the potential when it exits here. And I've drawn it pretty exaggeratedly, but maybe you have a different slow roll parameter afterwards.
Okay? And the details will be model dependent. I'm just giving you a cartoon picture, yes? Okay. And so relative to the simple picture, you have something different that imprints itself on the initial conditions. So what about, uh, what about the time evolution part? Maybe I don't have something that affects inflation. I have boring vanilla, single field, slow roll inflation. But I have some new species Do I just use these guys to erase? Yes, OK. So what governs uh, the evolution of these perturbations afterwards? Well, it's the equations of motion uh, of the system. So for example, the Einstein equations. So I'm writing this in terms of the reduced uh, Planck mass here. So this is uh, 8 pi g Newton. So here we have the stress energy tensor of the standard model stuff. But now we add to that the stress tensor of my new physics stuff, x. OK. Now, what, this, what might this x be? Perhaps it's uh, some additional relativistic or quasi-relativistic uh, degree of freedom. Like maybe you want to play with a warm dark matter model or something instead of a cold dark matter model. Uh, and so this thing is kind of moving around a little bit faster or is uh, quasi-relativistic that might affect the growth of the perturbations that are seeded during inflation, it might change the evolution of those into these. So this would sort of uh, 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 delay structure formation. OK. So I want to say a couple more words uh, about the initial conditions. OK, so now uh, where do these uh, initial conditions uh, come from? So we uh, presume that they're uh, seeded uh, during inflation, uh, but they don't have like a particular setup. They're drawn from some sort of probability distrib distribution. What we uh, assume is that there's an inflaton that is uh, 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 undergoing quantum fluctuations uh, and during the process of inflation, and that those uh, quantum fluctuations they have you know, some uh, uh, composition in terms of their superposition. Uh, and then at some point, they get resolved uh, onto standard uh, classical uh, uh, obser observables. And, uh, but they're statistical in nature because they were drawn uh, from a quantum probability distribution initially. So what it looks like is these zetas. can be found by integrating over some probability distribution uh, for uh, uh, what created, that, that depends on what created these perturbations. 
So we might consider there to be some uh, uh, reference model of inflation, like this uh, V of phi slow roll here. Okay, so, and it's the probability distribution that uh, is kind of our first input. So we want to ask the question, what, in, what is the uh, probability distribution uh, produced by my favorite inflation uh, model that gives rise to uh, this particular set of correlation functions uh, uh, that describe the initial conditions, okay? So if you like, this is the, the source of the, or the generator for uh, all of the uh, correlators for those initial conditions. And when we say we've got a, a new model that has new physics in it, like this one here, then what we're doing is we're comparing P reference of zeta with an alternative hypothesis that has uh, this this new physics or whatever, uh, you know, maybe it's a chaotic inflationary model that you're interested in. Okay, you put in your, your second favorite model and you compare it to, to this guy here. Where X is your new physics. Okay. Okay, so this is to uh, just, just set the stage. We're interested in uh, uh, how new physics affects these and this. And so uh, uh, now what I want to do is uh, just go, go back a little bit and uh, talk about what is uh, the picture that we have uh, if it is just the standard model uh, in the game, perhaps with the addition of dark matter that uh, uh, ends up being an important ingredient even at low scales. So we're going to start. at temperatures uh, in the early universe that are less than the QCD crossover, all right? We'll come back to things up here, uh, but right now we want to lay out the uh, standard model picture. And so we'll begin here, which is uh, the point at which uh, our universe is uh, populated with uh, baryons and photons uh, and electrons and neutrinos, okay? Okay, so the playground that uh, we'll be uh, uh, working on is in part inspired by observation there are uh, uh, two ingredients that uh, seem to be uh, in a, a, a uh, uh, part of our universe, and that is if we uh, go to different places uh, in the universe, things look the same. Uh, and if we look in different directions, uh, we don't see that there's a special preferred direction. And so those uh, two things are referred to as homogeneity and isotropy, respectively. So there are perturbations on top of this, uh, but there is an overall uh, uh, evolution of uh, the, the, the universe uh, in which we can make this uh, as the starting point approximation and then look at small uh, deviations uh, from this uh, uh, homogeneous and uh, uh, isotropic universe. Is there a hand? 
No. Okay. And so there is an object that governs distances between things, our metric. And if we uh, insert uh, these uh, uh, requirements, we get what is known as the FRW metric, or FLRW. where we have uh, a scale factor governing uh, the time evolution of the expansion of the universe. And we then have a metric governing our, uh, the, the three-dimensional space. Plus r squared times the spherical vo volume element. K references uh, the curvature of the uh, three-dimensional space. So this here is the metric of a uh, maximally symmetric three-dimensional space. And it can be either uh, positive, uh, negative, or zero the evolution of the universe will sort of damp uh, the effects of this uh, K overall, okay? If it's positive, then this has the geometry of a three sphere. If it's zero, then it's Euclidean three space. And if it's negative, this is hyperbolic space. And you can show that uh, uh, this is the solution to uh, Einstein's equations uh, in vacuum, where you have not added any matter to the right-hand side of uh, Einstein's equations, that there is such a solution. And if you have uh, Mathematica in that package, uh, I encourage you to check that this is the case. That is, throw some function of r uh, in front of here. And see that if I calculate, uh, 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 say, the scalar curvature and set it equal to zero, this would be taking the trace uh, of the Einstein equations with no matter, that there is a unique solution uh, for f of r given that f of very small uh, r, much less than k squared, Uh, asymptotes to one, okay? So for very small r, uh, this should go to one. So there's a, you know, you need to, there's an integration constant that you need to fix, yes? Okay, so that is, you don't need any cosmological constant or something for the spatial curvature part. This is just a, a solution to Einstein's equations with no matter. Okay. The effects of this curvature term, if you actually calculate uh, you know, r uh, in this case, and uh, you look at what it looks like, you can sort of think of this thing, even though there's no fluid on the right-hand side of Einstein's equations, you can think of it as sort of a fictitious fluid whose density, this curvature fluid, 
scales like 1 upon a squared. Okay? And this is a, a famous problem because where the heck is this stuff? Uh, if you look at the uh, decay of matter and uh, radiation, uh, they fall off faster than curvature. Uh, they fall off like uh, 1 over a to the 4 and 1 over a to 3, uh, respectively. And so, you know, where the heck is this stuff? So you have to either tune this k to be really, really, really small so that uh, the numerator is uh, uh, small, or you set up conditions so that a is really, really, really big, uh, which is what happens during an accelerated period uh, of uh, early expansion. So it's either fine-tuned or some sort of dynamics fixes the problem for you. Okay? This is a, the co a cosmological hierarchy problem, if you like, where the, the fine-tuning in K is, has to be a part in about 10 to the 31 if you want to get the right answer. Uh, and uh, look, there's a, a geometric warping that fixes uh, the, uh, the, the hierarchy problem for you for, uh, for curvature. Okay. And we'll come back to that, but it's just interesting to note as we go by. And uh, because it's either terribly fine-tuned or something fixed it, we're going to set k equal to 0 uh, from here on out. OK. Good. And please ask questions as we go. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm running at the mouth here, and so I want to uh, uh, have some interaction if possible. But maybe it's because you've all, all already seen this. So the next thing you can do is ask, given the presence of some fluids in the early universe, what is the evolution of this scale factor A? Right? We plugged in something consistent with the symmetries uh, that we wanted, homogeneity and isotropy. Uh, we got rid of the thing that we know is small. Now, what does this thing do? The way that we figure out what this thing does is we write out the Einstein equations. And again, if you've got that Mathematica package, I uh, encourage you to quickly check that what I'm saying now is right. Yes? with 1 over a cube for matter and 1 over a4 for radiation. Uh, yep. So this is for what, I mean? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, this is if I put this k in here, right, and I don't set it to 0. So we had three options. We had positive, 0, or negative uh, 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 spatial curvature. Uh, and there's you know, a number here. Uh, that maybe corresponds to roughly to the value of the curvature that we have today, okay? Uh, and if we want to trace that back, then there uh, is sort of an, a, an effective spatial curvature that uh, sort of a, accounts for the expansion of the universe that goes like 1 over a squared. So if you like, this is kind of like the effective spatial curvature as a function uh, during time in the evolution of the universe. OK, this has nothing to do with the energy density. Yeah, it's, it's a fictitious energy density because there ain't nothing on the right-hand side of Einstein's equations, right? It, it's purely in uh, the, uh, uh, the scalar curvature. So if you calculate the scalar curvature, you'll see a part here that goes like k over a squared. OK, yep. thank you. Very good. Anything else? All right, so we're taking k equal to 0 from now on. And uh, as uh, I'll uh, uh, probably be doing in most of the lectures from now on, we'll also uh, dive into a slightly different parameterization for the time coordinate. That is, we'll go to conformal time, where a, uh, a, a, a shift in the time coordinate produces a metric that overall has a scale factor a of tau out in front, and then minus d tau squared. And now, since we've got just Euclidean three space here, we can just write dx 
vector squared for, uh, for the rest of the metric, okay? And so uh, with this uh, uh, set of uh, coordinates, we can calculate the, the tau tau and say the space space Einstein equations and uh, uh, see what they uh, uh, tell us about the development of the scale factor. So before we set k to, to zero, um, why uh, can't it evolve in time, for instance? So, so I, I encourage you to stick a k of t here and then uh, uh, do this and see if you can solve the equations without putting some stuff on the right-hand side. So, so what, what we're doing here is just asking uh, uh, the question, you know, what uh, uh, you know, sort of metric can we, yeah. can we put here that has uh, you know, this, uh, this kind of, this kind of uh, 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 solution to it on the right-hand side? Because if I put some matter here, then I'm not necessarily going to be satisfying uh, these, these conditions. We'll add some matter afterwards, right? Uh, and so then there'll just be some other stuff that depends on time. It won't be this K. So if you like, there's a, a set of fluids. One of them is sort of this fictitious fluid K, and then the others are actual fluids that appear on the right-hand side here. Mm, okay. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, so what are the Einstein equations giving this metric? You can calculate the tau tau Einstein equation. And uh, the geometry part looks like 3. And now this is a derivative with respect to uh, conformal time tau over a squared. And the ii, or the spatial-spatial components, are all identical because of the, the symmetry. And so you get, and we can call this 3 scripty h squared, so it's sort of like a value of the Hubble parameter, but uh, in conformal time. And uh, uh, what we have here is now 2 scripty h dot minus scripty h squared. And now we've got to put some stuff. And we'll write it with up-down indices. And here we have uh, the energy density of the stuff, and then the pressure of the stuff. Okay. And so now, when we uh, continue to write the right-hand side of the Einstein equations relating the uh, geometry to the matter, then uh, what we have is 1 over m Planck squared. And because we're not taking into account perturbations right now, we'll keep track of these by putting little bars on these that's saying that these are sort of the average quantities when we average out over the fluctuations. And we have 1 over m Planck squared, rho bar, a squared, and we have 1 over m Planck squared, p bar, a squared. OK. And so uh, uh, again, you can sort of have your uh, favorite uh, geometry package calculate 0, 0, and i, i, and you can uh, confirm these, which are the Friedman equations. OK. So it'll be important for us to understand uh, how particles uh, move through this geometry, like what happens to, say, a, a photon as it's traveling around with uh, this scale factor that is evolving with time. And so the way that we do that is we solve the geodesic equation. which you can get, if you like, by, uh, uh, if you're familiar with the calculation, um, uh, extremizing the, the world line action for a particle uh, moving through a uh, non-trivial uh, 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 metric geometry, OK? And you have the four momenta. You can write down this equation involving the four momenta 
where it's p nu, del nu, p mu is equal. So now if I stick in the Christoffel symbols associated with the uh, covariant derivative, this looks like p nu d p mu by d x nu plus gamma mu nu rho p rho. Okay. Uh, and now the, the form momentum, uh, uh, the structure of the form momentum is going to depend on whether you've got a, a massive particle or a, a massless particle. That is p mu, and we'll factor out a uh, 1 over a for convenience so that the energy corresponds to what we would normally call the energy of a photon if it hits us. And it's a three momentum, which if this is a, a photon or a mass, another massless particle or really any uh, a species that is relativistic uh, for all intents and purposes uh, in whatever uh, uh, frame we're interested in, This will be equal to 1 over A, and then E, and then E times some unit vector corresponding to the direction of motion uh, for the photon or uh, other massless species. Okay? And so now what you can do is ask the question, well, what happens to, say, the energy, which would correspond uh, to looking at the uh, uh, differential equation governing the evolution of P0? So we plug this uh, momentum into this equation, and you can uh, massage it a bit. You need to work out the Christoffels. And what you get out after some fiddling around is that 1 over E, dE by d tau is minus 1 over A, dA by d tau. Uh, and now uh, you can uh, manipulate these things so that you can just uh, find out the energy as a function of the scale factor, and you get what you uh, expect, that the energy scales like the inverse of the scale factor. So this is the redshift uh, in the photon energy uh, as the uh, universe is expanding. So the first question you might ask is, what does a photon look like uh, now compared to what it looked like uh, in the Euler universe? Well, you have to integrate the geodesic equation over the time when the photon was produced versus when it reached us. And we'll obtain then the, uh, the redshift factor uh, associated with the non-trivial geometry that the photon is propagating through. OK. Good. So now you can play around with combining these equations. Uh, what you might do, perhaps, is uh, take the derivative of one and uh, 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 you know, add it to some combination of the other. You can kind of mess around and see what do these equations tell us. Uh, and what you can find is that there is uh, an equation governing the time derivative of the uh, energy density uh, relative to the energy de density and pressure uh, at that point. So sort of like the uh, divergence-like equation that says that the uh, uh, energy, uh, uh, the time derivative of the energy inside of a box is going to be equal to the amount of, uh, the time derivative of the energy in the box is going to be equatable with the energy flowing in and out of the box, right? Just a conservation equation. And so this tells you that there's going to be uh, a relationship between rho bar dot and uh, the work done by the expansion and 
by the pressure acting on the box, which is changing its size as a function of time, yes? So you can get this from the Einstein equations, or equivalently, you can get it uh, from calculating the divergence of the stress energy tensor and setting it equal to zero as it must be, since this is a uh, conserved quantity. So either from the Einstein equations or from good old del mu t mu nu equals zero. OK. So now let's talk a little bit about how to characterize uh, you know, the stuff that's appearing here, the ener this stuff that's uh, contributing to the energy density and the pressure. And typically, given some sort of uh, fluid that you have, there's going to be some relationship between the uh, energy density and the pressure. Uh, and for uh, 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 non-interacting fluids, like uh, we're, we're taking non-interacting to be a, an approximation here, there's a nice linear relationship between the pressure and the energy density, where P is equal to just some number times rho, where that number depends on the uh, fluid that we're considering. Uh, perhaps it's a relativistic fluid. Perhaps it's a non-relativistic fluid. Perhaps it's some weird fluid uh, that uh, you know, isn't either of those. And from this, since we have a nice relationship between the energy density uh, and the pressure, we can simply factor out rho bar, put a 1 plus w here, and we can calculate the time evolution of that stuff given uh, its uh, equation of state parameter w. And depending on which type of species we're considering, so maybe there's some different contributions. You have a little bit of massless stuff. You have a little bit of massive stuff. Then uh, rho i is either the massless stuff or the massive stuff. And it will scale like e to the minus, a to the minus 3 times 1 plus w, which you can get by integrating the continuity equation. Okay? And so uh, uh, here is a, uh, a pretty quick homework question uh, for you. Why can't stuff go, or why isn't there any stuff that goes like 1 over a to the sigma with sigma greater than 6? Okay. And so a, a hint for you uh, is ask uh, for yourself, what is the speed of sound uh, in this, in this uh, hypothetical fluid with a big sigma? OK. So here's our picture. Here's our geometry. Here are the basic equations that govern, in the, that govern the evolution of stuff that we have in the universe and uh, the geometry that it is living in. So now let's try in the next 30 minutes or so, and if not, we carry into it uh, tomorrow, to talk about what is the standard model evolution of the universe at temperatures low, lower uh, than the QCD phase transition. So what's the stuff? Let's just make the list. The particles in play in this epoch are photons, that's a crappy gamma. Photons, that's an even crappier one. <laughs> gamma, all right, there's a good gamma. Neutrinos, 
nu. And we have the electrons and their antiparticles. E plus minus. We've got uh, protons. And we've got neutrons. Whoops, didn't write out the protons. OK, so these are the basic things in play. Uh, and then even though they're not part of the standard model, they still play uh, a uh, non-trivial uh, part in the story that uh, we want to tell. So we'll kind of add in parentheses some uh, cold, dark matter. OK? And what we want to do now is be able to bookkeep what are these things doing uh, uh, during the evolution of the universe. They have some distribution of uh, energies and momenta. Uh, and the way that we bookkeep those uh, energies and momenta is through distribution functions. And these distribution functions have a label for the uh, species that we're considering, A. And so A is just either gamma, nu, E plus, E minus, blah, blah, blah. And these distributions are different at uh, every point in the uh, spatial universe at some given time. So these distributions evolve with time. So we're not, uh, uh, there, there's things that are changing in here. And then uh, the distribution of the momenta uh, of those particles uh, at that time. And so you can use these distribution functions to do things like calculate uh, the uh, uh, number density of one of these species. Whoops, forgot the G. So we have uh, just some number that's telling uh, me how many uh, actual degrees of freedom, internal degrees of freedom, are associated uh, with each of these. Right? So uh, you know, fermions have a spin up, spin down component. So we've got uh, two to add for those. Uh, photons have got two polarizations. That's uh, out in front. We're presuming that there's no distribution uh, in the polarizations. And we integrate over the distribution to get the number density at position x. OK? So we have uh, uh, these uh, uh, things that when we integrate uh, over the distribution, we get uh, the quantity at some particular uh, spatial point. And we can use these distributions to calculate things like the energy density as well. And I won't write the argument, but we just have E as a function of K. Or you could get uh, the pressure density Okay, um, and if, if you like, this comes from calculating the, the stress tensor uh, components for uh, the, uh, you know, a particle with uh, momentum K, which uh, when you integrate over it will give the effective uh, pressure density at that point. You need to divide by, by three since there are three of them down here. That's where this factor of three comes from, is averaging over a particle velocity uh, 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 dotted into its direction that comes from calculating the pressure. OK. And so now the question uh, next is, what are these uh, distribution functions? If we make the presumption that uh, the species are in thermal equilibrium,
then these distribution functions take on the usual uh, 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 Bose-Einstein or Fermi-Dirac distributions. Okay, that is sort of the average uh, FAs as a function of E are one over e to the e, and if I have some chemical potential mu, and that will appear here, divided by t, and then just plus or minus one for fermions or bosons, respectively. Okay. And now, uh, thermal equilibrium is a uh, good approximation so long as uh, the uh, interactions uh, between particles are uh, fast enough to maintain that thermal equilibrium. So they're scattering off of each other as the universe is expanding. Uh, and uh, uh, if we assume thermal equilibrium, then this uh, means that that interaction rate must be fast enough for the particles to find each other before the expansion of the universe you know, pulls them too far apart. So there's a competition uh, between the expansion of the universe and this ansatz uh, that we're making for these distribution functions. So keep that in mind. Uh, and now uh, the next thing to do is ask, well, what happens in thermal equilibrium if a uh, species goes uh, non-relativistic? This energy uh, contains the uh, rest mass energy of the particle, and so if the temperature starts to drop below uh, the mass of the particle, then all of a sudden we don't care anymore about this plus or minus one because it's dominated by this huge exponential over here. Okay, and so if mu equals zero and t is much, much less than the mass of the species, then we get a, a Boltzmann suppression uh, for that species if it is maintained in thermal equilibrium. Okay. So we can see right away by looking at our list of particles over here, we're starting off at temperatures that are uh, well below uh, the, uh, the QCD crossover. So I've got a bunch of uh, uh, baryons around in the protons and neutrons. They're pretty heavy compared to everything else. They're about uh, you know, a GeV in mass, uh, but we're considering temperatures lower than TQCD well below TQCD, which is about 100 MeV, okay? So that means that protons and neutrons, if they're in thermal equilibrium, are experiencing a fairly severe Boltzmann suppression. So at the uh, sort of our, our starting point for talking about uh, uh, this cosmology is that there aren't a whole lot of protons and neutrons around compared to the other much lighter species, okay? So now, if we do the integral here for uh, some of the other species that we uh, have around, which again, I encourage you to do with your, your favorite uh, uh, symbolic manipulation tool, uh, just stick this in. If we are uh, only looking at the average densities, uh, we don't need to worry about the dependence on x. All we got to do is uh, stick this in there. And uh, what we uh, uh, get out, for example, for the mass of a species being much less than the temperature, i.e. in the relativistic regime, then 
the average density, uh, energy density of that species is going to be pi squared over 30 times the number of degrees of freedom of that species times the temperature rise raised to the fourth power, but it depends on which sign you pick. So again, you just toggle the sign in Mathematic and you'll get a different number out. Uh, and so this is multiplied by either 1 if your species is bosonic or 7 eighths if you've got a fermion. Okay. And so you can consider, for example, uh, in the early universe, what is the uh, total energy density in uh, relativistic species, which again is most of the game uh, at this uh, point because of the Boltzmann suppression of the protons and neutrons. We're uh, in a radiation dominated phase, we would say. Then rho bar for that uh, radiation is, can be written as, uh, pi squared over 30 times what we often write down as a total effective number of degrees of freedom, g star, times t to the fourth, where this g star just sums over all uh, of the particles in the game at this stage of play, which is I'm over fermions of 7 eighths GA, okay? So when we write G star, we mean at that point in time, the sum over, for example, of the photons uh, and the neutrinos, is say if we're below the, uh, the electron, mass, significantly below the uh, electron mass. Okay, or if you're above the electron mass, then you've got to include the electrons over here, right? So it depends on the epoch, what the effective number of relativistic degrees of freedom is. So now let's talk about the transition between relativistic and non-relativistic, uh, bearing in mind that uh, we have to watch out for uh, whether or not I'm uh, maintaining thermal equilibrium, okay? And so this is the picture of what we call freeze out. So our universe would not be very interesting if the protons and neutrons continued forever being Boltzmann suppressed uh, and we've got nothing but a bath of uh, you know, photons and neutrinos uh, left over. So we want to have uh, uh, some mechanism by which they stick around and the universe supplies us with that because There is that non-trivial competition between the expansion of the universe and the rate of interactions as they occur. Okay, and so now what does this look like? So, uh, the basic picture is that, and I guess it's just up there, but I'm just gonna write it out here to sort of uh, talk about the different aspects uh, of this uh, plot up here. If I have some interaction rate gamma, and what might this interaction rate be? It, uh, what, what might the interaction be? It might be, uh, you know, say the uh, uh, scattering of, um, I don't know, our cold dark uh, matter off of itself. Uh, to standard model, standard model. Uh, but this uh, process goes both ways uh, if this is a, a high interaction rate and I have the phase space to do it. So I write a left, uh, right arrow uh, for, for this, okay? Uh, and in this way, the uh, uh, dark matter 
that's bouncing off of the, itself to produce standard model, model particles, annihilating to form standard model particles. Uh, this is efficient early on. And so I am maintaining uh, equilibrium where n over t cubed uh, is about constant if these guys are relativistic, OK? Then they start to go non-relativistic. And so this starts to drop like a stone if I maintain thermal equilibrium because of that Boltzmann suppression. And so I start going like this. But then at some point, this interaction rate, uh, you can compare it to the figure of merit uh, for the expansion of the universe. And that figure of merit is the Hubble rate itself. So when gamma is about equal uh, to the, the Hubble rate, then this picture changes. And there is a relic density that freezes out uh, at this point. Please out. And so now you say if I make the interaction strength very, very large, then I'll go further down this curve and I'll get a smaller relic density, right? If it's uh, uh, too weak of an interaction, then I freeze out earlier and I get a bigger uh, relic density. And so this happens not just to cold dark matter particles, but it happens to neutrinos, uh, which are kept in thermal equilibrium through the weak interactions. And the same thing with uh, the neutrons. They're also kept in thermal equilibrium due to the weak interactions. Okay? So uh, this, this freeze out, it's not just for dark matter, it's for uh, the standard model particles uh, as well. And this is why uh, we still have protons and neutrons uh, around uh, without tiny, tiny exponentially suppressed uh, amounts. Okay. Okay. You can ask why not the strong interactions for the neutrons. It's just there's not enough protons around uh, to have that rate be high enough. This interaction rate is also going to depend on the number densities of the particles in play in this uh, interaction. So you need the number densities to be high enough to maintain a high enough interaction rate as well. OK, so the neutrinos are what decouple first via this mechanism. They actually don't go non-relativistic, uh, but they freeze out anyway before they get a chance uh, to become non-relativistic, just because their mass is so small. So you don't need an intermediate non-relativistic phase for this to play out. OK, and this uh, happens at a temperature uh, of uh, uh, around 1 MeV. Soon after the neutrinos decouple, So this temperature is still a little bit above uh, the uh, mass of the electron and positron. So the electrons and positrons are still kind of in the game. Uh, but at some point, I'm passing below uh, the mass of the electron and positron. And so the uh, annihilation process, E plus E minus goes to gamma gamma, is going to uh, dominantly go forward to gamma gamma. And so you can ask, what's going to be uh, the relative temperatures of the photons and the neutrinos? Something happened to the photons that didn't happen to the neutrinos. 
Before that, they're both going along with the same number of degrees of freedom, two spin polarizations for the neutrino, uh, and uh, two photon polarizations for the photon. And so uh, in equilibrium, they're going to have the same energy density when I, uh, when I calculate this for the neutro neutrinos and photons. Yeah? Uh, however, because there was an injection of energy uh, into the plasma after the neutrino is decoupled, then you can uh, expect that there's going to be a slight difference uh, between the final temperature of the neutrinos uh, versus the, the protons. And it's a relatively simple calculation because all I need to do is uh, 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 look at, so if, the, if your action proceeds slowly enough uh, that it's going to uh, occur adiabatically, when these things uh, 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 annihilate. And so if you uh, just conserve the uh, entropy density in the, in the situation, then the entropy density times A cubed, which is rho plus P over T A cubed, you know what to plug in for rho and P for these and you know the number of relativistic degrees of freedom before and after, and so you can use that to calculate the ratio of the temperature in the photons to the temperature in the neutrinos. And the, uh, the ratio is 11 fourths to the 1 third power. And this 11 fourths purely just comes from a counting experiment uh, and conserving relevant quantities like T times A, uh, which will be uh, conserved for the neutrinos, but change uh, for the photons due to that injection of energy into the plasma. I was going to work this out for you, but I'm looking at my time, and so uh, I think we can skip that part, or you can go ahead and read it in uh, Daniel Bauman's notes or many other uh, 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 great references for early universe cosmology. And so the neutrino temperature today would be about 1.9 Kelvin uh, compared to our uh, 2.73 for the photons. Okay. I think I probably have enough time to uh, get almost to where I want to stop today. I have five minutes, right? A little bit over five minutes? Yeah. It's a, it's a cloudy. <laughs> okay. Um, so now let's talk. About relic neutrons and a little bit about Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So these are going to be uh, the ingredients that uh, go to build uh, elements like helium-4 uh, and uh, uh, trace elements of deuterium uh, and helium-3 and uh, lithium. So we're sort of proceeding down the energy scale, right? So our neutrinos uh, decoupled. Our E plus and E minus uh, have annihilated. At this point, there's going to be approximately equal numbers uh, of electrons and protons because they're the only things that carry charge now. And the total charge of the universe uh, has got to be zero. Uh, otherwise, our production mechanisms violated gauge invariance. And so we trust that probably there's the same number of electrons as uh, uh, protons at this point, roughly. There might be some positrons floating around still that didn't quite you know, make it into uh, gammas. There's, there's still some antimatter floating around. Uh, and so um, now uh, these neutrons, as we said, they decouple around the same time as neutrinos. But in the meantime, uh, there were Boltzmann suppressed. So at very high temperatures, there's about the uh, same number of uh, neutrons as protons as they're kept in thermal equilibrium because they're about the same mass. But at some point, that mass difference becomes important 
as uh, they are both getting a, a Boltzmann suppression. Okay, so at high T, you've got the N of the neutrons is about equal to the at number density uh, of the protons. But then, uh, because the proton's just uh, a little uh, bit uh, heavier than the relative uh, uh, abundance of these are going to go like e to the minus delta m over t. That's the two competing Boltzmann factors weighed against each other. And so at the uh, relevant time when the, the neutrons uh, uh, decouple from thermal equilibrium, you've got a relative density of neutrons and protons that is approximately one-sixth. Okay? And then uh, uh, now that the neutrons decouple and are uh, moving freely, they uh, will now just decay when they feel like it. And the lifetime for the neutron is approximately 15 minutes. And so at the time uh, relevant for when the uh, neutrons are combining with the protons to uh, form elements, some of these neutrons have decayed. And so this ratio, because of neutron decay, ends up to be around uh, one seventh, okay? So out of every uh, eight nucleons, uh, you have got uh, one uh, neutron, okay? So these are the kind of the number of things that we have to glue together uh, during uh, the formation of the uh, uh, heavier elements, or the, sorry, the light elements, okay? Um, so over the next few minutes, the neutrons and protons are finding each other to form first deuterium, and then uh, these deuterium go on to find each other uh, to form uh, helium-4. Okay, uh, and this is mostly what forms because this is just the thing with the strongest binding energy. Uh, that's the, uh, the sort of quickest thing that gets made uh, before anything else gets a chance to get made. And if that's the main thing that's formed, everything else is just a, a little uh, a, a perturbation on that, then you can just do another quick uh, counting here to ask uh, how much uh, helium do we expect uh, compared to the other elements, right? I've got two neutrons and two protons. Uh, and so there's going to be some number of protons left over. Uh, and so uh, uh, what do we expect? If you do the calculation, you expect roughly 25% helium-4. And uh, the rest uh, is going to be in hydrogen. OK. Uh, and then there are some trace elements. Not all of the deuterium uh, uh, found each other to make helium-4, so there's a little bit of deuterium left. Uh, uh, you'll form a, a little bit of helium-3, but not very much, since this was the dominant channel uh, through which you would form it. Uh, and, uh, and then again, there's a, a little uh, trace amount of lithium formed, even tinier amounts of uh, beryllium uh, and things like that. So this is uh, the, the rough picture that I wanted to get through today with the uh, only exception of the last uh, uh, thing that uh, you know, happens here is that there's a, um, the, the epoch of uh, first matter radiation equality at about uh, 50,000 years after the Big Bang. And then uh, uh, not long after that, at about 380,000 years, uh, there is uh, the uh, 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 recombination uh, epoch where the remaining electrons find the remaining protons and combine to form neutral hydrogen.
So this is just when the, the 1 over a cubed uh, meets up with the 1 over a to the 4 uh, in the decaying densities of the uh, uh, relativistic stuff and the massive stuff. So even though it was initially Boltzmann suppressed, eventually the expansion of the universe uh, uh, makes matter win. And then at about 380 kiloyears, E minus plus P plus only goes forward rather than uh, remaining in equilibrium. And we get hydrogen plus a photon, OK? And at this point, I've neutralized the, the universe almost completely. Uh, and so these photons have nothing to hit anymore. There's nothing in the universe. Everything is neutral uh, to a very good approximation. And so these gammas are the uh, gammas that free stream and form the CMB. OK. And so this is going to be uh, the focus of the next, next lecture uh, to characterize uh, uh, this last remnant that is uh, nicely observable by us. Oh, I forgot to put that picture in uh, the cosmic microwave background radiation. And we'll talk about how to characterize uh, this picture and how uh, the, this, this story that we've told here imprints itself uh, on the structure of the CMB. All right, thanks, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Jay. Uh, that's great. Uh, questions or comments? So uh, my question is actually in two parts. So if you have a deuterium, I would expect that you can like stick a neutron to it and get uh, helium-3, which right. I guess is metastable, so it would decay. And in that case, do you delay the, you know, the nuclear synthesis because it decays and you have to uh, start all, all over again or, or not? Uh, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I am not... Uh, this is not my particular wheelhouse, but maybe there's somebody else that, can, uh, that knows the, uh, the situation better. Yeah. So, so you're asking about uh, so the, the deuterium just meeting up with the hydrogen, yeah? Yes. Or, yeah. Uh, no, uh, I mean that you have uh, deuterium. Wait, no, that's confused. So uh, if you have deuterium, you have one proton and one neutron, right? Yeah. right? Yeah, yes, yes, okay, yes. so you add a proton, you get helium-3, helium three, right, but right. it will decay, right, because it's, uh, it's metastable? Uh, no, the helium-3 helium sticks around, right? Uh, there is oh, helium-3. Okay. It's, it's used uh, you know, in, in awesome condensed matter experiments where they have it in jars. They'd be very unhappy if their helium-3 uh, uh, decayed on uh, uh, the, the time scales that we're interested in, because then they'd have none of it, because uh, uh, you know, there's fantastic superfluid spin stuff. OK, so, so yeah, the helium-3 sticks around. It's, it's, okay. it's stable. Yeah. OK. OK, so just don't make it because it's, well, the binding energy. Yeah, yeah, it's just not the preferred uh, uh, channel for uh, uh, production. Just the helium-4 uh, just wins out by a huge margin. And so you get, I, I, I think I wrote at some point the, the numbers. I don't think I wrote in these notes the fractions, but I have it uh, somewhere. I think it's on the order of 10 to the minus 5 as a mass fraction or something like that. But uh, yeah, maybe I write it quickly next time what the actual numbers were for lithium uh, fraction and things like this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, helium-3 is very expensive, but I don't think it's because it's decaying. Yeah, it's very rare. <laughs> uh, uh, helium-4 is cheap. <laughs> yes. Uh, any more questions or comments? Yes. Uh, I'm not perfectly sure if I understood correctly why um, the density is dropping before the freeze out in the uh, your freeze out picture. So could you maybe briefly comment on, again on this? 
So why, why is it dropping in, in this region here, or? No, I mean, the, there everything is relativistic. We're in thermal equilibrium. The reaction goes in both directions. And then, like, what are the dark matter particles or the standard model particles? What is getting non-relativistic and suppressed? So, so there's a Boltzmann factor that starts yeah. to, so, so the, you know, once your species goes non-relativistic, uh, you no longer have uh, the, the distribution uh, looking like a nice uh, uh, Bose-Einstein or Fermi-Dirac. It primarily is just the big, huge exponential in the denominator that uh, starts to drag everything down if it's maintained in thermal equilibrium. So it's, it's dropping because of Boltzmann suppression. So this is the Boltzmann suppression picture. But that only uh, is maintained so long as you're in thermal equilibrium. Uh, and thermal equilibrium is determined by the interaction rate, which uh, needs to be greater than the Hubble rate. Uh, otherwise, you won't actually uh, you know, get the process to, to go backwards, right? So, so uh, at some point, the interaction rate slows uh, uh, because of the decreasing number density. And at that point, you freeze out uh, to whatever was there at that point. Notice this is rescaled by T cubed, so it's sort of constant in the relativistic regime, and then once you have freeze out, it's uh, constant again. Yeah. Thanks. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, so this is the would be Boltzmann suppression, but you don't stay in thermal equilibrium forever, and so you freeze out eventually. Cross sections can't be infinity, right? Hi, I have one question. Uh, so when you were talking about earlier inflation, you mentioned there is this vanilla model where the field doesn't talk to anything. And then you introduced a new physics model where you coupled it to some other field. Uh, right. But uh, uh, so I have a very naive question. So for us to produce radiation, uh, we have to couple fields with inflation uh, at somehow. So, uh, so how does they not affect uh, in the like actual when uh, there is this accelerated expansion, how do you uh, like switch off those interactions? Are they dynamic or? Yeah, so there has to be some kind of picture where I, I exit this slowly rolling picture, which I, I did not draw in, uh, in those pictures. And so uh, maybe I draw a toy model for reheating, which uh, uh, gives, gives rise to a non-trivial population of stuff, right? Uh, and so a toy model of finishing the inflation picture um, is to have my slow roll regime, and then at, at some point uh, during the evolution of the inflaton, it reaches a uh, dip in the potential, where slow roll is now violated. And so there is a long inflationary epoch starting here, but then once the inflaton field reach, uh, reaches this point, we consider inflation done. Uh, and then this field rolls quickly down. Uh, and now we'll begin to oscillate back and forth in perhaps the minimum uh, of its potential. And now you can say, maybe I do give a small coupling of uh, my inflaton field to uh, standard model particles. And that means that this oscillating field is not going to oscillate forget forever because there's a damping due to the decay associated with the inflaton to standard model stuff. And so now the oscillations will be damped uh, because of this decay rate. And the energy that was in the inflaton has now uh, been transferred uh, to the standard model degrees of freedom. And so, yeah, there, you need to continue the picture with some kind of plausible story about how to uh, uh, reheat the universe uh, afterwards. And maybe it comes about through some small coupling between the inflaton and standard model fields, mm -hmm. or maybe some more complicated uh, dynamic, uh, you know, secondary fields that it couples to. You, know, you, can, you, can have a, you can do a lot of model building associated with this that makes a more uh, uh, rich picture than the one I just drew. But in your, in your mind, you can maybe think about something like this uh, as a, a plausible story for reheating. So uh, when you said that the new physics could be, for example, inflaton coupling to Higgs, that means that it is some enhanced coupling which changes the slow roll, uh, like the way it is decreasing. But like down, like when you come down the potential, then like essentially the couplings are small. Uh, yeah, I know you have to come up with some, some I, I threw out Higgs there just as uh, you know, some, some particle that we know and love that's, in, that's interesting. Uh, it could be something else, it could be the Higgs, but you have to, uh, 
you have to connect you know, that story to all the other observations that we make if you do want it to be, to be the Higgs. Uh, so I didn't say, it was a very, very toy model. Uh, just uh, something you might draw. Uh, of course, we know that later on, we know what the couplings of the Higgs are. We don't see it you know, making inflatons. You know, we have to uh, you know, draw the, the whole picture uh, in that case. And yeah, the effective couplings do change because this inflaton, you know, once it settles down at its final resting place, might actually set the value of couplings, uh, right? Because that, that field phi you know, might be uh, sitting in, in front of something else, and when it reaches its VEV, then that you know, sets some other, some other uh, parameters in the theory. Right? OK, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, what you showed at first was um, that we can, well, we can change the initial conditions or we can change the evolution, right. basically. Mm -hmm. So then you need at least two observations to um, constrain your model. And uh, now we have the CMB, and I think we have like elements at um, Big Bang nuclear synthesis. But what are the other um, constraints on cosmology? Yeah, we can look out at the distribution of galaxies. Uh, we can look at what, uh, say, the current Hubble rate looks like now versus uh, you know what it uh, what it looked like uh, earlier on. Um, we can look at supernova data. There's all all kinds of uh, so the. I, I envision a, a very diverse set of observables uh, on the right-hand side, uh, uh, all of which we're getting data for from you know, very many uh, 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 you know, cosmological experiments that, uh, that, that we're doing. CMB is just one great one. We we're able to get uh, a lot of very uh, precise data that highly constrain uh, things like the models of inflation that you might uh, consider. Um, and, uh, uh, like I mentioned, neutron stars. Uh, you know, neutron stars are another way uh, to get at uh, get at interesting, interesting, interesting physics. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. Any more questions? Very good. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Back to this toy model that uh, you talked about uh, in the beginning with this, like, I really want the toy yeah. model. <laughs> <laughs> Some, yeah, somehow uh, of course. we all got stuck on that. Um, <laughs> so I understand the point you make when you say, okay, there is an era where this low rolling doesn't make a lot of sense. There is back reaction there. Right, but right. then I don't understand the point where you said, when I exit this, the slope might change. Is it because of, like, you change geometry or? Uh, not because you necessarily change geometry, but there is some interaction between uh, the inflaton uh, and, that, and that field uh, that it was coupled to it. It might be that the, the huge energy density that you produce in the, the particles, uh, uh, you know, ends up, you know, maybe moving the inflaton fast uh, down, down its potential. So, uh, uh, you know, maybe, you know, the, the the picture was again a very cartoony picture, uh, but it, uh, you know, I imagine this thing you know, going down as a function of time. Let's write the whole potential V of phi, right? Maybe it looks like this. Uh, and maybe that uh, uh, epic right here where I uh, you know, produce those particles, as soon as I enter it, uh, the slow roll is violated because uh, of this other guy. And of course, there's another direction in the potential here that I'm not drawing, all kinds of stuff that's not getting drawn here. Uh, but during that epoch, I accelerate you know, how the field gets from this point to this point. Maybe there was a shortcut, or, or maybe I just end up on some other uh, 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 you know, slope in the sort of uh, uh, you know, two-dimensional potential between phi and chi. So that effectively, when I come out over here, I have a, a, a potential characterized by different things. So that it's just the fact that I can't draw you know, a, something with 10 fields in it uh, or whatever goes into you know, creating that, that toy picture there. Thanks. So I guess you can think about just accelerating the picture. So it's not just a plot of V of phi, but sort of V of phi before and V of phi after. OK, this question down here. Is there some reason why the gamma the free freeze out take place when gamma is proportional to h? Is there some reason that uh, it be so? H? So it comes uh, from solving the Boltzmann equation, uh, you know, for that species. So you look at the comparison numerically of the forward and backward weight uh, for that for that process, and you you solve the equation. Uh, uh, but to a good approximation, uh, it's the case that. 
uh, when you solve that equation, the sort of figure of merit in the equation is the comparison between the Hubble rate uh, and the interaction uh, rate. So you just solve the equation numerically, and that will give you the actual picture for your actual species, right? So I'm, I just didn't want to you know, write out in too much detail what was going on, but yes, you, you can do it uh, numerically and get an accurate prediction for the uh, freeze-out temperature of your uh, favorite dark matter particle or for the neutrinos, et cetera. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, you have, uh, you have talked about a model uh, where there is just one uh, annihilation e uh, equation, but there is some dark metal models where co-annihilation effects matter. Yes, So, yep. Yep. So my question is, is a little basic, but what changes if I consider there is a lot of reactions like uh, dark matter particles with standard model particles interacting? Because in some models, I know that um, it makes the cross-section, the thermal cross-section get higher. But what changes in this picture? So if you, if you have a, a number of species kind of all around at the same time uh, and, uh, uh, you know, all uh, playing a role in this relic density, uh, then it's just that the, bo the, set, the set of Boltzmann equations that are going to be coupled now because you have many species, all of their number density is kind of important at around the same time. Uh, uh, and the, 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 there's still this rough figure of merit that's important for sort of that overall sector. Uh, but if you want, you know, sort of the actual answer for your particular model, then you need to solve the coupled uh, equations. Uh, and, that'll, and that'll give you the answer uh, for, for this picture. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. Um, in, the, in this kind of, of inflation scenarios, like uh, this, um, um, this model, uh, we can't use the slow roll uh, approximation for the calculate. Uh, I, yes, so, so observationally, uh, uh, there are uh, constraints from you know, what we see uh, in the cosmic microwave background anisotropies that point towards uh, 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 certain aspects being necessary uh, to explain uh, those, those uh, observations. Um, and if you want this inflation to actually solve the problems that it solves, then this, this slow roll is an important part of that as well. Uh, so, so we get from data uh, slow roll parameters uh, that I, we will talk about later. So uh, we'll, this will be in later lectures uh, th this week. Um, uh, 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 Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> um, yes, we will, we will look more uh, at these specific models and what the slow roll uh, approximation means and why it's important. Uh, and uh, I guess we'll get there when we get there. And we'll talk about how different aspects of uh, the uh, inflaton potential imprint themselves on uh, those, uh, uh, the, those initial curvature fluctuations. Oh, okay. Thanks. So yeah, hold tight. <laughs> Anyone else from this side? <laughs> Since I'm here. <laughs> no? Okay, somebody from the other side. No? Okay, well. Uh, then let's uh, thank uh, Jay again for a great lecture. All right, thank you. And we come back uh, tomorrow morning. So uh, I was going to.